just check the chat to make sure that the the mic is okay. Okay. Um, so here we go. Uh, a man goes into a cinema. What happens next? So he sees there's a woman sitting in the same row, and he notices that she has her dog with her. Now, this dog seems terribly intelligent. He, he seems to be paying a lot of attention to the movie. And, you know, when there's a sad part in the film, he sits there looking sad. When there's a happy part, he looks happy. He wags his tail. And then the film ends, at the end of the film, and the dog sits up in his seat and starts clapping. Well, the man can't believe his eyes. And he turns to the woman and he says, that's amazing commenting on the dog. And she says, well, what do we expect her to say? What she says is, he says, that's amazing. And she says, yeah, I know, it is amazing. He hated the book. Uh, so that's, that's what we call the punchline. That's the bit in the joke that makes it funny, if you do find it funny. Um, and the question is, why is that funny? Um, it's funny because there's a mismatch. There's something incongruous going on. They're both saying the same thing. They both think it, it's amazing. He says, that's amazing. And she says, yes, it is amazing. But they think it's amazing for different reasons. Um, so there's a mismatch between what one person is thinking and what the other one's thinking. Um, he's thinking, it's amazing that a dog could be so intelligent and follow the film in that way. But she's thinking, it's amazing that my dog liked the film because he really hated the book. So that's kind of how jokes work. It, it's a, a mismatch in, in messages between, between two people in a conversation. Um, and there's something kind of subversive about that, because what jokes do is they, they confound our expectations. We, we're expecting one thing to happen, uh, but then something else happens. And it's like having the kind of rug pulled from under your feet. Um, and this happens a lot in humor, uh, and, just, uh, and, and of course it happens a huge amount in the Alice books, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, here's a good one. Groucho Marx um, often um, tells these what we call one-liners. And uh, there's, there's a film, uh, one of the, I can't remember which Marx Brothers film it is, but where he says, gentlemen, these are my principles, and if you don't like them, well, what are we expecting him to say next? Normally if someone says something like that, it would be like, these are my principles, and I'm sticking to them. Uh, if you don't like them, that's too bad, because I won't compromise my principles. That would be a sort of normal interaction, but this is a joke, so it doesn't work like that. He says, gentlemen, these are my principles, and if you don't like them, well, I have others. Um, so what makes it funny is that it's the opposite of what we would have expected. Um, so. What's going on here? There, there is a, a linguistic explanation for this. Um, there's a, a language philosopher called H.P. Grice, Paul Grice, who was a linguist who worked in philosophy of language. And he was interested in the, con the conventions that govern conversation and other interactions. Uh, and the important thing here is what he calls the cooperative principle. Um, and this is the idea that in an interaction like a conversation, both sides cooperate with one another to create meaning, to, to understand the meaning of what's being said. Um, and you can, uh, there's a, a decent Wikipedia article on, on, on the cooperative principle if you, if you don't want to read all of Grice's books. Um, but that's, that's the idea. And it, it describes how people normally behave when they talk to each other, how, how, what you expect in a normal conversation. And it is a reasonable assumption that the person you're talking to is trying to understand what you mean and you're trying to understand what they mean in a conscientious way. And what happens in jokes is that all of that gets kind of turned on uh, its head. Um, but why do we have to cooperate anyway? Um, well, the reason is, I guess, that uh, language is full of ambiguity. Because most words, or an awful lot of words, um, have more than one meaning. So in theory, that means there are multiple different ways in which you could interpret what someone else says. 
but in practice, um, it works pretty well. Um, we usually do understand one another um, because we cooperate. Uh, and jokes in general, and particularly, I think, absurd humor, um, it sort of subverts this. It turns it on its head. Um, there's a kind of deliberate misinterpretation or deliberate failure to cooperate. And that's a very big feature of the Alice books. Um, again and again in those books, the communication uh, breaks down uh, because the two sides are using different logic. So here's a classic English joke, which, which just shows you know, the, the inherent um, ambiguity of language. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of this one. It's, it's pretty simple. It's just a man walks into a bar, so what are we expecting? Uh, that's one meaning of bar, but then he goes, ouch, uh, it was an iron bar. Um, bar has lots of meanings, but uh, it, it, it works because um, when we hear the first line of the joke, a man walks into a bar, we're expecting one kind of bar, and then the punchline um, tips it all on its head, and it turns out that we're wrong. Um, we think we know which meaning is intended, but, but it turns out that we're completely mistaken. So just to sort of summarize on that about the corpus principle, that in normal situations, we almost always understand one another because we cooperate. It's in our interest in, in, a, in a conversation to cooperate in order to establish uh, what the meaning is. So this will be a normal situation where, you know, remember going back to the, the man and the woman and the dog in the cinema, where he would say, oh, that's amazing. And you would expect her to say, yeah, I know, he, he's a really clever dog. Um, well, that's fine, except that it's not really funny. Um, so the point is that that's what would happen in a normal situation. But of course, jokes are not uh, normal situations, and that's that's how they work. Going back to the Alice books, these are full of absurdity and full of conversations where people are not cooperating. Um, and there's a uh, a well-known one here with Humpty Dumpty. This is in Through the Looking Glass. Uh, he says, here's a question for you. How old did you say you were? Uh, Alice made a short calculation, and she says, seven years and six months. But Humpty Dumpty says, wrong. You never said a word like it. And she says, oh, I thought you meant, how old are you? Or if I'd meant that, I'd have said it, says Humpty Dumpty. Uh, so he's kind of not cooperating with her at all, because when you say to someone, how old did you say you were, that's just a kind of conversational convention. It's like, what did you say your name was, or something like that. But he takes it literally. He, he says, you didn't actually say at all what your, how old you were to begin with. So essentially, uh, he's not um, cooperating. And that's where the, uh, that's the basis for the absurd humor uh, in the Alice books. Um, because basically each side in these interactions, each side has its own logic. Um, but they're different kinds of logic, so they don't, they, it just, it, they, they come up against one another and it means that uh, they are, uh, they're just not, they're not cooperating and they're not having a normal conversation. Um, And, uh, well, here's another example. This is from the, the, the well-known Mad Tea Party, where you have the Mad Hatter and the March Hare and the Dormouse. And uh, the March Hare says, take some more tea, he said to Alice. I haven't had any yet, Alice said, so I can't take more. But then he says, well, y you mean you can't take less? It's very easy to take more than nothing. Well, that sort of makes sense. Um, but, it, you know, again, Alice and, and, and the Hatter have got two completely different types of logic going on. And so there is uh, this miscom miscommunication. Um, what I want to do in the rest of the session um, is uh, talk about the impact of the Alice books on the English language, uh, talk about how they influence and how they reflect um, sort of English humor. Um, and then I'll look at some categories of humor uh, with some examples of that. And then finally, after that uh, very difficult question, uh, can you teach this? 
other things that we can do uh, about um, teaching humor. Well, as far as the impact on the language goes, uh, there are quite a lot of words and expressions that have entered English from um, uh, Lewis Carroll's books. I mean, expressions like mad as a hatter, grinning like a Cheshire cat, all these words like chortle that, uh, that he actually made up. Uh, in um, that's particularly in that poem about the Jabberwock. Uh, we talk about going down a rabbit hole, which is sort of uh, entering some sort of bizarre uh, world where all the rules are different. Um, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, uh, two characters in the books, are, is actually used quite a lot um, as, as an expression. Um, you find it a lot in political discourse, actually, and it, and it sort of is a way of saying, oh, two people or two things are so exactly the same that you can't tell the difference between them. Uh, and you, you get this a lot in politics. Here's an example. The parties have released their Tweedledee and Tweedledum manifestos in which it's clear there's little difference between them. And here's a nice one at the end where something different is going on. It says the, the election between Gore and Bush, he characterized as a contest between Tweedledum and Tweedledummer. Um, so that's, a, that's another little thing that you can do, is you can take an existing, let's say, an idiom, a phrase, well-known expression, and twist it, uh, and uh, in a way exploit it to, to create uh, another idea. Um, and then, of course, there's the actual phrase, Alice in Wonderland, is it's an entry in the Macmillan Dictionary, and it's, it's used for talking about a strange situation in which everything seems to be the opposite of what normally happens, and that, so I think, describes it very well. And you get examples like this from our corpus, where it says, the introduction of so-called internal markets in health services, and with them, the possibility of an Alice in Wonderland world of perverse in incentives. Um, something here about the security services. It, they, in their Alice in Wonderland world, can redefine the, tr the truth as it pleases them. Um, so that's uh, the, the expression Alice in Wonderland is actually used um, as, uh, quite a lot in, in English. There's plenty of examples on our corpus that we can find. Um, this is a very fav favorite quote from Humpty Dumpty, which is, has always been popular with um, linguists and lexicographers, people, people I work with. Um, because part of our job is to try and figure out what words mean. Um, Humpty Dumpty reckons that a word can mean whatever he wants it to. Um, but is that true? Uh, I would say no. Um, words can't just mean anything you want, because that would violate the cooperative principle. Uh, if in a conversation you refer to a dog, but you mean cat, then um, Communication would break down. I mean, it, it, that just wouldn't work. We always have to assume that when we use a word, we're using it in a, in a way that other people will understand. Otherwise, uh, no kind of communication um, would work. So, uh, the last one here, what I would say is that, yeah, can words mean whatever we want them to? No, but there are things that you can do in terms of playing around. You can play with the fact that a word often has several meanings. The idea, you know, the man walks into a bar and so on. You can create what we call exploitations of existing words and phrases, so that uh, you take a well-known phrase and you play around with it. That that one we saw, Tweedledum and Tweedledumma. So you have to understand first of all what Tweedledum means, and then uh, tw Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and then and then you can take it a little bit further. We can also create new meanings of existing words, but only as long as they make sense to the listener. I mean, that, that happens quite a lot. So I'd just like to look at um, a few of those. Uh, one of them, of course, is the word, is, is these portmanteau words. Um, the, we, you, you'll find a lot of portmanteau words in, our, in all our sort of new word areas on the dictionary. Uh, Portmanteau words, sometimes called blends, where you have two words put together. But the actual term portmanteau word was invented by Humpty Dumpty um, in the books. He invented, uh, he was explaining the word slithy in that poem, you know, about the slithy toves and so on. And he says, well, slithy means lithe and slimy. Uh, lithe is the same as active. And he says, you see, it's like a portmanteau. 
there are two meanings packed into one word. Well, notice that he says it's like a portmanteau. So he's not just saying this is a portmanteau word because no one has used that expression before. So he starts by using a simile and says, well, it's like a portmanteau. But um, then he uses it a second time and he says, well then, mimsy is flimsy and miserable. There's another portmanteau for you. So now, you see, the new meaning has already been established. Um, so this time he doesn't say it's like a portmanteau. He just says this is a portmanteau. Um, so within a couple of uh, paragraphs, we've gone from him introducing this meaning and saying, oh, it, this is like that, to just using the word and saying this is a portmanteau. And that is now um, uh, you know, a well-established word in English to describe um, blends. It's a very, very common mechanism by which uh, new words are created. And if you, if you look at things like the buzzword pages on, on the Macmillan Dictionary or the Open Dictionary, the crowdsourced one, look at the archives of that, you'll find loads and loads of blends. Um, here are some recent ones. I mean, these are just ones that have arisen in the last, whatever, five, five or six years since Twitter um, was invented. And there's a huge number of words related to that, words like Twitterati, which is formed by analogy with the word literati, which there's also glitterati as a version of that. Um, and this is Twitterati, and Tweetathon, you can see, is like based on the idea of a marathon and, and Twitter. Tweetart is like sweetheart. Uh, Twitter side, um, I'm quite sure what that means. Uh, killing yourself, killing your reputation by using Twitter, maybe. Um, well, we can look it up. Um, so th there are very, very many blends in English, and an awful lot of new words that are entering the language um, are created um, through that process of blends or portmanteaus. And um, you know, let's remember it was. Humpty Dumpty, who actually, um, inve I mean, blends existed before that, but he invented the term portmanteau word, and um, uh, of course the Alice books are, and, and his poems and so on are absolutely full of these things. Now, uh, another big thing is polysemy. Polysemy is the fact that words often have more than one meaning, and that this is a very common source of humor. The old man walks into a bar uh, thing again. Um, here's, a, here's another old favorite where uh, someone says, Doctor, I've eaten something that disagrees with me. And his, <laughs> what he's eaten, which is in his stomach, now disagrees with him and says, no, you haven't. Uh, so again, the two meanings of disagree with, the usual one where you, where you don't agree with someone. You say something like, yes, I did, no, I didn't. Uh, but there's another meaning of disagree with, which is if you eat um, if you eat food that disagrees with you, uh, it means that uh, it makes you feel ill. Um, and there's a very a nice one I, I like here, which which takes account of the fact that the word take off has more than one meaning. Uh, and here are two of them. One is the thing that planes do. A very common meaning: the plane should take off on time. If an aircraft leaves the ground. That's 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 what it takes off, but take off can also be, you know, someone starts a new business or maybe makes a record or something, and it really takes off. That means it, it suddenly becomes um, very successful and popular. Uh, so there's a nice joke uh, which plays on that um, ambiguity and meaning, and it goes like this: uh, My grandfather invented the cold air balloon, but it never really took off. Um, this is somebody called Milton Jones, who's, who's uh, an English um, uh, comic, uh, stand-up comic, and uh, he, his act is absolutely full of, I mean, he's, he's, he's a, a gift for anyone interested in language and linguistics, because it, most of his act is, is, is exactly along these lines, and I think I've got another one of his um, a little bit later on. Playing with words, well, puns, puns is an obvious one. Puns is where you have two words or expressions which sound alike but have completely different meanings, and there are an awful lot of these in, in the Alice books. There's this one where she's talking with the mock turtle and the griffin, and uh, she said, how many hours a day do you do lessons? And the mock turtle said, 10 hours the first day, nine the next, and so on. 
What a curious plan, he says. But the Griffin explains, that's the reason they're called lessons, because they lessen from day to day. Um, well, it's not that funny, but um, it, that, that is uh, very typical of uh, a lot of things that go on um, in Alice, a lot of the um, conversations involve puns. Um, I wanted to mention a, a very famous uh, English um, sketch, comedy sketch, uh, which is called the Four Candles sketch. It uh, even has its own entry in, in, in Wikipedia. It's, it's, I think most British people would, would know it uh, really well. Um, the basic idea is there's a dialogue going on in a hardware store. So a man, you know, customer walks into the hardware store and starts asking the salesperson behind the counter for things. And he starts by asking for, he comes in and says, four candles. And the shop owner thinks he is asking for four candles. Um, is, he isn't. He's asking for. He eventually explains it. I mean, the the, the shop owner. He he gets out four candles and puts them on the on the counter. And the bloke says, the other customer says, no, 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 that's not what I want. He says four candles. Handles the forks. This is like garden forks, and this is this is a fork handle. Um, and there's a whole series of misunderstandings like this, which are based on puns, and it, it continues for um, several minutes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is an absolute uh, masterpiece, and I, 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 I warmly recommend it to anyone who, who doesn't know it already. You, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm doing a PDF version of this PowerPoint show, so um, Henry will be posting that at some point, so that um, if there are links on here, um, like these ones, uh, you'll be able to get them off the PDF. So. I wanted to say something about one-liners. Um, one-liners, actually, it's a slightly misleading term because usually it, 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 it's a short joke in, which is in two halves. It's usually actually two lines. Um, you have a short, simple statement followed by a punchline. Uh, let's just have a look at some of these. And again, it's about upsetting our expectations about what comes next. Oscar Wilde of course, a master of, of the one-liner. Uh, and he says, uh, always forgive your enemies. Uh, Groucho Marx, this, this is the beginning of the one-liner, and I'll, I'll show you the end in a moment. Uh, one, Groucho Marx where he says, one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. And then Milton Jones again, the one who did the one about the cold air balloon not taking off. He says, what does my girlfriend do for a living? Well, it's difficult to say. Um, and here's the answers. Uh, Oscar Wilde's one, always forgive your enemies, nothing annoys them more. So it starts off with uh, always forgive your enemies. It sounds like a very high-minded, very moral, sincere sort of thing to say. Uh, but then it turns out that uh, he only wants to forgive his enemies in order to irritate them. Uh, Groucho Marx is a simple one. One morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. Um, the one I really like, though, is this Milton Jones one, where he says, what does my girlfriend do for a living? Well, it's difficult to say. Um, she sells seashells by the seashore. Um, that's a good one, because, um, no, let's go back. Um, you know, when you, this expression, well, it's difficult to say. It's just a kind of conversational convention. Um, actually, if people ask me what I, I do for a job, I, I often will say, well, it's difficult to say because I don't have a kind of obvious job like being a teacher or a doctor or a police officer or something like that. Uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult to explain. But what he's saying, it, it's difficult to say. He sells seashells by the seashore. He's, it's absolutely literally. It is, it's a tongue twister, a well-known tongue twister in English, and it is literally difficult to say. So we are, and there's a kind of, uh, again, a linguistic explanation for all of this. Um, Michael Hoey, um, very distinguished linguist who is also um, uh, a chief a chief advisor to Macmillan Dictionaries, as it happens. Uh, but Michael Hoey's book about lexical priming, which came out about ten years ago, um, that 
the idea of priming is that, uh, well, as he explains it here, as a word is acquired through encounters with it, it becomes cumulatively loaded with the contexts and co-texts in which it is encountered. Uh, and what that means is that as you learn words from, from being a child and, and growing up, you learn them through hearing them, through encountering them, and you tend to encounter them in, in the context in which they normally occur, uh, and therefore you uh, you learn not only the word, but the, the context in which it's likely to happen. If, if, you, if you keep hearing the word crime as you're growing up, you'll you will kind of remember that it often comes with a word like commit or with serious or something like that. Uh, and it sort of explains collocation. So we think we know what to expect when we see a word or expression, but then in jokes, um, something different happens. Um, so when I say, oh, well, it's difficult to say, that really is a convention meaning uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain. But then he says, she sells seashells by the seashore, and that completely disrupts the whole thing, and, and it breaks the priming, as, as Michael Hoey would say. Um, stereotypes is a, I'm calling this non-lexical priming, because it's another kind of priming where um, if, you, if you see a stereotype, you expect them to behave in a certain way. So. This is very common in Monty Python. They they like to have these what they call what I call stereotypical English civil servant or English uh, city gent or something like this. You know, a man wearing a pinstripe suit, uh, carrying an umbrella, carrying a briefcase, wearing a bowler hat, and we have certain expectations as to how someone like that is likely to behave. They're probably a bit conventional, a bit formal, perhaps a bit stuffy, uh, and and then you get things like this, you know, the, the famous Monty Python Ministry of Silly Walks, where this very conventional looking person uh, behaves in a way that is utterly uh, unexpected. Uh, and stereotypes are actually quite closely related to spoofs. Um, a spoof is where you have a, a, a complete piece of entertainment um, which looks like um, a particular uh, genre. And it's another kind of priming because you you, you have certain there are certain things that you um, you expect, um, and so you get spoof movies where you have things like zombie movies, and then you get a, a film like Shaun of the Dead, which is a zombie movie, but but it's a spoof. Uh, the Austin Powers films are uh, kind of like James Bond, but played for laughs. Um, Naked Gun, I mean, anything involving Leslie Nielsen, like the air, air, airplane ones and so on, they're all spoofs too. And you even get documentary spoofs, the, the one on, uh, this is Spinal Tap, the, the imaginary heavy metal band, is a kind of documentary, but we call it a mockumentary because it's, um, you know, it's a bit different from the usual kind. Um, there's a... And it works because we, we understand the conventions of the genre. We, we kind of know what to expect, but then something else happens. And this is the theme again and again with, with uh, humor. Um, actually, there's a very good Spanish website called El Mundo Today, um, which is, um, looks exactly like a conventional news website, but in fact, all the articles are invented and just kind of done for laughs. The last kind of humor I wanted to talk about was um, Sarcasm. I, I think it's a form of humor which British speakers are especially fond of. Uh, sometimes it's just down to the tone of your voice. I mean, there are two ways of saying this. Thanks a lot. You've been a great help. Uh, it could either be completely sincere, but it's quite often not. When people say, oh, thanks a lot. You've been a great help, I must say, which means, of course, the opposite of what you're saying. Um, this is very common in, in Faulty Towers. Uh, Basil Faulty is, 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 is very fond of a little bit of sarcasm. Um, and it's sort of, there's, there's, a, thing, there's a, an, uh, <coughs> a situation where one of the guests at the hotel has requested a room with a view, and she isn't satisfied with what she gets. And she says, when I pay for a view, I expect something more interesting than this. So what does Basil say? I mean, a normal hotel manager would say, well, I'm terribly sorry, madam, we'll move you to another room. But um, he doesn't do that. He says, well, may I ask what you expected to see out of a talky hotel bedroom window? The Sydney Opera House, perhaps. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Herds of wildebeest sweeping majestically across the plain. Um, and he goes on like that. You know, it's, it's uh, a, a classic example of um, sarcasm. So... Um, 
Well, we, we come to the last bit, which is teaching humor. Can it be taught? Um, well, it's, it's a very long time since I was uh, a language teacher, um, more than 30 years. <laughs> so um, I don't think my ideas are particularly great, and I bet all of you could come up with some better ones. It would be kind of interesting to hear what you come up with. But here's one. You know, students just tell you ask the students to tell a joke that they know, and then and then discuss, you know, what, what, why is it funny? What is the humor based on? Is it based on puns? Is it based on polysemy, the fact that words have more than one use, and so on? Um, here's another one. Just ask people to create a short spoof. So to take a particular genre, like a news broadcast, or weather forecast, or, and, and, and do a spoof version of it. It could be like, say, uh, some event in, in, in the history of their country, or something like that. Um, Another one, just find something funny on YouTube or Twitter or whatever and, and ask the students to explain what's funny about it. Or you can do the same with a cartoon in a newspaper, like that cartoon I showed you of, um, uh, you know, I've eaten something that disagreed with me, uh, no you haven't, etc. Or another one, give the first part of a one-liner joke, but without the punchline, and ask the students to guess. Um, what the what the uh, what the punchline is likely to be. Uh, these are just a few ideas I'm sort of throwing out there. But also, you could try playing around with a well-known phrase. I mean, remember that thing about Tweedledum and Tweedledummer. This this is a very interesting uh, thing in English, especially if for people who are a bit more advanced. It's where you actually take something which is which is part of the language and um, exploit it, change it. Um, here's here's one I found in a TripAdvisor report which takes a well-known expression and it changes one of the parts. And they say, oh, this is easily the worst meal I've had in years, the decor was outdated, the service was pathetic, etc., etc." And then they end up by saying, what's not to hate? Well, there's a very common expression in English, what's not to like, and what they've done here is, is turned it on its head. And I think that's kind of an interesting um, challenge for people. Um, there are rhetorical questions like this, which, which are very often used humorously. Um, there's one, one I like, well, is uh, uh, what could possibly go wrong? So you, you have a kind of build-up, uh, or who says romance was dead, uh, often used very ironically. Um, so if you, you start with a, a rhetorical question like this, and then get the students to write the sentence that came before, and, or imagine what, what might come before it. I mean, here's an example from uh, a couple of examples from our corpus. Uh, these were old-fashioned secured loans packaged into tradable securities. What could possibly go wrong? Of course, that's the origin of the of the financial crash of 2008. Um, or again, later the trainees find themselves stationed on a remote missile base accompanied by several insane nuclear weapon missiles. What could possibly go wrong? Um, you know, you can you can sort of see uh, how that works. Um, so this is my last screen, which is really just uh, to um, to say, well, you know, do have a have a look at Macmillan Dictionary's humor pages. It's MacmillanDictionary.com. Learn English humor. Uh, this is a an infographic that's on there, but there's loads of other stuff, um, links to videos and and, and so on, and, and to blog posts. Uh, so the, as I was saying on on Tuesday in the session on Tuesday, there's a huge amount of information. Um, of different types on the dictionary website. So I hope that was uh, of interest to you, and thank you all very much for tuning in and, and, and listening. And I think we might have time for some questions. So I'm going to pass over to Henry at this point, um, who I think will will sort of moderate the the rest of this session. Uh, but I'll be here, and I'll try and I'll try and answer questions. Bye for now. Thank you, Michael. Um, now, um, Michael can't hear me, but what we're going uh, to so do... So, Henry, I've got the, the chat um, thing uh, tipped, uh, so if you want to say anything... Well, actually, I, can, I, I might be able to hear you anyway. Okay. Uh, so, please, now, can you all write questions in the box if you have them? No, and then I'll pass them over to Michael. Put any, so, I'm just typing a message to... Uh, Michael, in here for you. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, let me it. just good. see if any good questions come in, and then I'll pass them over to Michael. Um, so if you want to ask... We're having a little bit of a problem with the sound, but... Uh, um, a question, then please put it in the chat box. Uh, okay, any rules for portmanteau creation? So I've passed the question over to Michael. Oh, yeah, that's an answer. interesting question. So the question I've been asked is, are there any rules for portmanteau creation? Um, there are, there are, you know, that's <laughs> there, there are always rules in language. Uh, rules meaning not things that are handed down by some superior authority, which doesn't exist, but um, rules that we can deduce by observing how portmanteau creation works, and then seeing um, what the what the kind of conventions of that process are. I have to say, I I, I don't know um, what the rules are. Um, it's generally two two words mixed together. I mean, I think the ones that are created by in, in, in that poem in, um, in Alice in Wonderland, you know, Twas Brillig and the Jabberwock and all of that, which is full of uh, portmanteaus, I don't think they're very good or very typical because, um, in fact, it's here, isn't it? Because it's not obvious at all what the, um, what, what's going on. I mean, you, you can't tell just, I mean, Humpty Dumpty has to explain what the portmanteaus are. Now, in, in real life, you never have to explain that. It, it, it should always be pretty obvious um, that, you know, if you have a word like Twitter and then you have um, a, a tweet a thon, uh, you know, you, you, you probably realize right away what that is. And, and um, if you're sort of inventing new words, they have to make sense. Or inventing new senses of, of, of existing words, they have to make sense to the people who are, who are listening to them. So that's, I think that's the best I can do to answer that question, but it is a good one, and it, and it would be work. Oh, what's my favourite joke? Actually, my favourite joke is the one I told at the beginning about about the dog in the cinema because it, it, it's one that's that's always made me laugh, and and it's a nice joke because you can tell it to anyone, like children, or you know, it's not going to upset or offend anyone. Um, but I think it's I think it's very funny. Um, what other books rich in terms of humour can you suggest? Wow, wow, there's so many, aren't there? I I very much like. Um, the P.G. Woodhouse books, um, you know, Jeeves, Worcester, and all of that stuff. We're just partly because they're they're very escapist, um, but they're extremely well written and and have very interesting um, kinds of humour. Uh, anything more modern than that? I can't think of anything offhand, but I'm sure. can humour be taught at primary school level? Goodness, what a good question! Um, I don't see why not. Um, I, I think, you know, kids, you know that cartoon about I've eaten something that disagreed with me and, and, the doctor says, and, and then the stomach says, no, no, you haven't. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are jokes at all levels. And, and I think kids, small children, you know, my, my, my grandson, who's only three, will sort of get the idea of a pun if you, if you explain it well enough. And certainly a five or six-year-old would, would definitely get that, where, you know, a word has two very clear, obvious meanings, and, and you exploit that difference. So, I think certain, I think things like sarcasm are probably very difficult for younger kids. But, um, but puns and, and wordplay, I think children like that. Um, final question: How to deal with cultural differences in jokes? Yeah, that's that, that's a good one. I mean, I, I thought about that when I was um, telling that joke at the beginning about um, about the dog in the cinema because I think that 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 sort of transcends cultural differences fairly well. Most people understand about going into cinemas and, and so on. But, but yeah, of course, there's an awful lot of humor. A, a lot of the Monty Python stuff, for example, is very uh, Brito-centric. Um, so there must be a difference, I suppose, between jokes, universal jokes and jokes which are quite culture-specific and where, where, you, where you sort of need to understand a lot about the cultural background. Um, and the most universal humor is slapstick and, and somebody like Mr. Bean, who, who doesn't use language at all, really. Uh, one of the reasons that's so successful is that uh, anybody can watch it anywhere in the world and, and get the joke. Um, but clearly, there's, there's, there's a sort of spectrum here of things which are either more or less culturally different. Um, Henry says that's the final question. So um, at this point, I think... Um, yeah, I'd just like to say 
thank you to everyone um, very much for, for tuning in. Do have a look at um, the Humor website and um, maybe at, yeah, if you're interested in, in, in the PDF of this talk, uh, which will be available soon. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up at that point, and um, I hope you all enjoy your weekend, and uh, hope to have a chance to talk to you again. Thanks very much. Bye.